Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Daniela. Um, it's really great to uh, be listening to all these amazing panels today. It's just such exciting content and really special to hear from people who are boots on the ground practicing this every single day, know what it's like to implement, know what it's like to execute. Uh, so with that being said, I am absolutely thrilled to be introducing the final panel of our summit. Uh, as you may remember, if you joined earlier today, my name is Anya. I'm the co-founder and chief operating officer of Diversio. And uh, like I mentioned, it's my pleasure to be introducing our panelists. So today we are uh, joined by Jamie King. Him, who's the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer with the Personnel Department at the City of Los Angeles. Uh, obviously, huge, huge, uh, I think the second biggest in North America or the third biggest in North America. Toronto is right behind you. We're like, we're almost there. We're almost there. Um, but Jamie, really, really excited to have you and your insights on what it's like to promote DI within such a large municipality. Uh, we're also joined by Joanne Taylor, who is the Chief Human Resources Officer at Minto. Um, and Minto is a construction real estate company, um, and obviously within construction, um, it's a it's a it, in some ways a space that is a little bit more traditional in the sense that it is more nascent when it comes to the DI conversation. So, really, lots of considerations there when you're when you're promoting the 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 topic and you're really driving that change. Um, so welcome, Joanne. Uh, I don't know, Joanne, if your camera is working, but hopefully we'll be able to get that get that there. Okay, there we go. We see you. Uh, hey, Joanne. Um, we're also joined by Jonathan McBride. Uh, Jonathan, really great to see you. I know that you're only able to join us for the first 30 minutes, so I'm planning on bombarding you with questions for that thir first 30. Um, and Jonathan is the government public sector DI leader and entrepreneur, um, and he is also a partner at Hedrick and Struggles right now. Um, and I know that Jonathan was actually uh, with BlackRock formerly, and he was the global head of diversity and inclusion there. So really excited to hear some of your insights and uh, cross-sectional and cross-sector insights across um, DI, the DI conversation, Jonathan. Uh, and last but definitely not least, we have Philippe Chikea, who is the Director of Strategy and Analytics and Advisory Services with Management Leadership for Tomorrow. And of course, they're a huge partner of ours um uh for for this summit so really excited to have you Philippe and to hear about all of the different ways that you're engaging with clients and supporting them on their DEI journeys so really wonderful panel um panel today really excited to have everyone thank you for uh for being here I think without further ado I'm going to kick things off and Jonathan maybe put you on the spot a little bit since uh since you since uh we only have you for a limited amount of time and one of the first questions that I'd love to ask is you've had such a varied career. You've you've done, you know, you've done DEI in government, you've done DEI in the corporate sector. What are some of your kind of greatest insights and takeaways around what you've seen works? And what are some of the things that you're bringing to your current uh, role and position uh, where you're, you know, hopefully continuing to drive all of that forward? Um, well, nice to be with you. Um, I'm actually hoping to stay the whole time. I'm, I'm going to try to stay the whole oh, time. We'll perfect. see if I, forget, if I get interrupted. But um, no, I mean, nice to be with everybody. Uh, excited to have the conversation. Uh, Jamie, you and I need to connect after this because we have like, we live similar lives. I'd love to talk to you. I'm in Santa Monica now. I'm an LA resident, so we should connect. Um, but um, actually, you know, I think the I think the different sector thing gets, uh, it's it's overdone. You know, in fact, one something else we started in government was something called the tri-sector leadership forum. And it was trying, trying to bring people together across sectors because we found, interestingly enough, that the biggest impediment in the U.S. for different people working across different sectors is the assumption each sector made about the other. And, mm -hmm. and it was actually, it was, it was definable and, uh, and identifiable. Um, but I, so I think people make a bigger um, uh, deal of it than maybe it is. And so one of the things I thought about was, you know, I went from the White House to BlackRock. So I worked for President Obama and I worked for Larry Fink. And those are two completely different sectors. And you know, people in either world would probably say the other is totally different. But there are a couple of commonalities between those two men that, um, because I, and one of the things I learned is that leadership at the top matters incredible. We teach around leadership shadow and how, like what you do, what you say, what you reward or penalize. 
so a lot is, is, uh, is leaves a long shadow. Um, and those men shared a couple of things in common, which made the experience somewhat similar, actually, which is one, they uh, were as smart as they were and as accomplished they were, they were always, they were learners. They were the kind of people that you could talk to about something and two weeks later, your words would pop out of their mouth and you were just like, wow, that's incredible that they were actually listening. Um, two, they were had a passion around this topic. And three, they're all, they're both high conviction people, meaning if they think something's right, they're willing to stand in front of like a, um, a lot of uh, people's yelling at them and they'll, they'll be confident in standing there and standing alongside you. My point being, I think as you do this work, regardless of sector, I think you need to look, who you're, look to who you're work, working for and around. I think it's a much more important variable to the work and to your satisfaction and the progress you're going to make are the people and the makeup of those people or constitution of those people, regardless of the sector they're in. But the second thing I would just say as a person who ran personnel for a while and was looking for people who could run complex entities for a short period of time, is if you want to get great at this work, actually move around the sectors. Like actually go to different seats, learn different languages, build different connections. Basically put your problem at the center of your design and then work in all the places that have an influence on it over time. It'll make you, uh, one, it'll be a more interesting life. And two, it'll make you highly valuable to somebody who's working for a president or someone like that down the road, who's looking for someone who can bring people together across all these sectors because you speak all their languages. Um, and the last thing I learned beyond just the fact that the leadership matters is I don't think you can ever underestimate the power of communicating well. I just, it's just, it's so hard to do effectively, especially in today's world. Um, when I had a magazine company, we used to have, people used to have to see a an ad three times before they could recall it. Depending on whose data you're looking at now, it's nine to 14 times, just because of all the stuff that's coming at us. And those same people work for us. So we're, you have to figure out how to break through the clutter. So uh, we spend too little time figuring out how, what message is going to get through and how we get it to people. We spend all the time thinking about what the message is. And uh, I think we need to invert that. Yeah, that's, uh, that definitely resonates and something that we come across quite a bit. The, the fact that you just have to keep messaging and messaging and communicating and communicating. And then hopefully at a certain point it, um, it lands and, and, you know, we, we move forward. I think, Jamie, when it comes to um, messaging and communicating to a lot of people, you are absolutely the expert. I know that you're the leader of the city's workplace um, equity initiative, uh, but also the city of Los Angeles, I think, has 44 independent departments. Uh, so when it comes to your work, I mean, how do you manage something like that? That's a, that's just a huge, sprawling, sprawling organization. Um, you know, it requires a lot of kind of setting meetings and meeting departments one on one. Um, you know, it's it's an interesting place to work, given that we have 44 departments and basically the way it's structured. Um, you know, the charter gives basically a lot of independence to each department and the charter is basically like our local constitution. And so each department basically operates kind of like its own subsidiary. So even though I work with a team of professionals and we provide DEI guidance to try to you know, push forward citywide DEI initiatives, a lot of the participation that the departments do on that front is voluntary. Um, and so we have to kind of meet a lot of our partners um, in a smaller setting, really connecting with our liaisons at various departments um, and also leveraging our partnership and our interactions with our labor partners. So um, our workforce in the city, it's, we have about 50,000 employees right now. We're hoping to get to about 60,000 and they're all represented mostly by a variety of departments. Um, many of which that we've all heard of here. Um, and so, you know, we have to work in partnership with them as well. You know, it's not just the elected officials. Um, and so a lot of that requires a lot of time. And, so, you know, we have been working towards trying to gather data and build a citywide inclusion plan, but that's taken a multi-year approach. Um, you know, and Jonathan knows, I'm sure that, you know, things work at a different pace in the public sector. And, you know, sometimes it's frustrating because, you know, we have so many stakeholders that we need to connect with so that we're all on the same page and share the same goal. Um, but that's also, you know, it's a good opportunity to create trust um, and to solicit buy-in so that, you know, once we're all on the same page about you know, one particular project as we branch out from those initiatives, 
you know, the idea and the concept has already been socialized. Um, but yeah, there's no easy, you know, quick way to do it. It requires a lot of time and it requires, you know, repeated investment in those relationships that we're trying to form. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. And I think some of some of what we've been hearing a lot from clients, especially our multinational clients that are sort of, you know, sprawling world, worldwide and have these um, many different offices or departments like you, is how do you balance setting a mandate at the top of the house that will be equally as applicable organization wide, but also allowing your departments and different divisions of the organization to have enough autonomy to sort of tailor it to what it is that they need what is that you know is there like a magic sauce there or you know there's no magic <laughs> it's just a lot of grit and a follow-up but what we've done um, and what we're working on right now is we've had um, an initiative that's been supported by you know the top executive at the city which would be the mayor's office and basically we've worked with them to have um, you know kind of a more generic um, broad initiative that's described. And then that's given each department um, a lot of flexibility in terms of deciding what their goals are for the next fiscal year. Um, because, I mean, we have, you know, police department, fire department, and then on the other hand, you also have, you know, transportation and sanitation. So these departments are all, you know, facing a variety of different types of challenges um, when it comes to the goals they want to set in the DEI space and the population that they're working with um, on an internal aspect. Um, and so kind of the method that we're with right now is um, we're trying to provide data that's been gathered by one vendor so that we're all working based on the same metric, um, but giving each department flexibility to decide, you know, what goals they want to pursue. Yeah, that makes sense. Almost like set the guardrails and the parameters, but then allow people the autonomy to sort of, you know, pick and choose how they operate within that. That's smart. Um, Joanne, I know that Minto obviously has offices across several different countries with a presence in Canada and the presence in the US. And when we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think the conversation is so different um in in our in different in different countries definitely very huge differences between Canada and the states how do you manage that as you set the tone for the whole organization how do you kind of go into it and do something that is also you know all encompassing but flexible enough to address those differences well I mean I think it's what Jamie was and Jonathan were mentioning and for us it's about leadership matters and yes there are differences culturally differences in how we do our work, even how we build homes, very, very different. There's no basements in the U.S., there's basements in Canada and the process behind that. But from a cultural standpoint, I mean, I think we've placed a lot of emphasis on ensuring that we've got the right leaders in the roles, in the right roles, and having that communication with them around what are our values. And, you know, Minto as a company, just to step back a bit, is it was started off as a family-owned business, 70 years. And the family that started the business and has continued to run the business up until the last um, several years um, was very much about we're a family and having a culture of respect and a culture of uh, that sense of family. And that, you know, we had parts of the family running the U.S. business and parts running the business or parts of the family running the business in Canada. So those common uh, cultural values were in place for many, many years. And as the business grew and non-family members moved into leadership roles. Um, we continue to build that culture. And it really just comes down to communication. About 10 years ago, when the family decided to um, move to having our CEO as a non-family uh, member lead the business, they took a lot of time in deciding who that person should be. They invested significant time and effort into that. And they hired an individual who is absolutely all about the people. Um, he's a CFO by trade and accountant. So the numbers matter and we're very performance uh, you know, focused, but he puts people first. And so very early on, and I joined around the same time as he did. And very early on, we started, he started uh, conversations with employees from all parts of the business, underrepresented groups, wanting to understand, like, what do we need to do to change our culture? Um, what are some of the issues that you're running into as an employee? What are some of the barriers that you're experiencing? And he did that all on his own without even, you know, the, the, the term DEI really being out there. So he then took that to his leadership team and said, I expect the same of you to be having these conversations. So I'll get more into later. I think he wanted to ask me a question sort of around um, how we go about 
you know, dealing with such a diverse uh, population as far as the type of work that we do. Uh, so I'll speak to our listening strategy there and how we collect that information. But it really just comes down to dialogue, to communication, having that common set of values. And I know that sounds a bit sort of um, motherhood and apple pie, but it really is driven from the top. And, you know, we just do our best to work through and have those individual conversations. And sometimes they're tough conversations. Like our construction side of the business and our biggest challenge, quite frankly, is it's not our employees. It's all all the various organizations that we're working with, the trades that come onto our sites, so maybe are just progressive and don't even speak English. And so we have lots of challenges, but we have a zero tolerance policy for any type of behaviors that may occur out on our sites. And we deal with those. Like a couple of years ago, we had some trades that uh, arrived on site who had Confederate flags on their trucks. And even though we needed to close our homes and we were on a critical delivery path for our customers, we asked them to leave. Um, we, you know, they wouldn't, uh, you know, they're not accepted. That kind of behavior is not accepted on our work site. So it's just kind of trying to walk the talk and, and, and live our values on a daily basis and having those tough conversations. And it is different, but, you know, I think we've got a common platform that we're working from and just trying to um, work together as a team, regardless of where we're working. So. Yeah, no, that's that's great. And I think it's so interesting what you were talking about the new CEO. One of the questions that I meant to ask you as well is, and you touched on this a little bit in, in what you were just saying, but the construction sector generally is, you know, has been lagging a little bit when it comes to the diversity, equity, and inclusion conversation. And so when Minto reached out to Diversio and you were so passionate about this subject, and this was really something that, you know, it wasn't just lip service, you were living within the organization that was really fantastic. And um, um, and new for us to see. And so, you know, my question for you is what drove that? Like what drove you to become this industry leader and how do you see your role as you move forward? Yeah. I mean, I think ingrained within our cultures, we want to be the best. We want to be the best builder. We want to provide the best service. We want to have the best quality. We want to hire the best people. We want to have the best workplace. Like it's very much part of our culture. So as I said, um, you know, our CEO is, is all about the people and, um, you know, so using respect and our values as the foundation, we were doing a lot around listening strategy and asking our employees for feedback on various things, but we had never really gone down the path of opening up that up more broadly to sort of start to ask questions about that were diversity, equity, and inclusion related. And we felt that that was a missing part from our listening strategy because we need to understand. And one of our challenges, quite frankly, it's more so on the Canadian side because of some of the restrictions around being able to collect data from our employees. We're provincially regulated. And so therefore, the only data we have in the system on our employees is gender and age. So we can't measure a lot. We have no way of knowing, you know, if uh, people from various backgrounds, whether they're minority, whatever, uh, LGBTQ+, how are we doing with respect to, you know, um, giving them opportunities to grow their careers? It's very difficult to measure. So we wanted to work with you guys to, you know, help us get more data because data is critical to being able to make decisions or set set metrics and make decisions. So that was part of our reason for partnering with you. And we also have part of our business that's publicly traded as well. And so on that side, in the real estate business in particular, having a clearly articulated ESG strategy is, yeah. is paramount. I mean, the investors will not invest with you if you don't have a clearly articulated strategy. And so we did an ESG materiality assessment um, several years ago. And you know, through that process, it was confirmed that we needed to do better at having a more clearly defined DEI strategy. Um, we were doing a lot of the right things, but we didn't really have it articulated in a manner that, you know, we could say this is our strategy. So, um, yeah, so that was basically, you know, I think why we made it a priority um, for you know, sort of a bunch of reasons, partly because we need to, on the public side, show our investors in the community that we do have a DEI strategy, but on the uh, private side, just continuing, continuing to build our organizational culture and be the most inclusive workplace where people want to come and grow their careers and um, be their authentic self. So, so yeah. No, that, that, that makes a ton of sense. And Jonathan, I see you nodding and smiling. I feel like you're BlackRock. <laughs> you like, you know, the ESG, it's just, it's it's definitely resonating. 
Um, but Felipe, I would love to pass it over to you. I think with MLT, you have such a breadth of experience with such a variety of companies. You know, I'd love to maybe hear from you. What are you seeing some commonalities across organizations with things that they're struggling with, as well as, you know, what are some best practices that you've seen really drive this, um, this in these initiatives forward? Thank you, Anya. Yeah, no, I think I think you have to think in, in a spectrum. It's very hard to find commonalities. We work with S&P 500 companies. We work with holding companies, uh, PE companies, and, and it's hard for to find two clients who are kind of like experiencing the same. Um, and that is because everyone is using different HR systems. They have HR systems. They have um, different experience. DEI teams are of different sizes. And, and what happens there is that um, it's very hard for these teams to find the data that they have, that they need, and they have it in one place. So <clears throat> part of it is all legacy HRS systems, but it is also who is responsible for pulling this together. And when you think about all these legacy systems or sometimes new systems, but you know, you don't have the, the, the budget to buy that analytics uh, platform that put things together. Uh, it becomes very hard to gather, aggregate, and blend this data from different sources and then transform it into clear, actionable information. Uh, Tina previously talked about uh, privatizing and the importance of working on a few things, but if you don't have that data in one place, then you don't have the data to be able to make the decisions that you have to do to prioritize. So, that is, that is one thing that is very important. The second thing that is important that we see with, with clients is that they're putting the burden of putting this data together, visualize it, and then contextualize it and give it to everyone, to the DEI team. And usually we find even S&P 500 companies that is a team of one. So it is, it is something that is very hard for just one person or a small team that doesn't have the capacity or sometimes they, they know how and how to put this together to put those to put those there. So we, we work with companies to help them structure that data, uh, visualize it. Sometimes there are clients where we go and we meet with them once a quarter, get the data, have conversations with different parts of the organization, which is critical to something that, that the, the previous panelists were talking about is that every company is different. And it's very important for companies to look at their specific situation and build analysis around the different levels. Matrix organizations that you know are, are becoming very common where you have divisions that are completely separate or you have geographies. It's very important that you look at the data, you start, dice it and slice it in such a way that you can give important, actionable information to each of those groups. And not only that, you have to de-average your um, population so that you're not doing the same things for different groups. What might solve the situation for the women um, in our organization is not going to be the same thing that is going to solve the situation for the Black talent or the Latina talent. So the aggregating that is something that is really important, and, and we help clients do that. And again, like there's going to be clients that are in different places. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Jonathan, maybe passing it back over to you. Um, it, the, the idea of data and collecting data is also kind of closely linked with the idea of transparency and how organizations share that back with their employees or how transparent they are about their, their, their strengths, but also their challenges and sort of what they're working on. Do you have any advice for, for companies who are maybe on the call listening in around how to navigate that, how to not just pull that data in, but also play it back to their employees? Well, I mean, the, the first thing is people don't have a lot of data on a lot of groups that they would like to have data on, right? Like the reality is that they the one thing that people collect the world over in a common form is gender. And then outside of that, it breaks into a lot of pieces with, in with incomplete data sets and people being fearful of disclosing so you don't even really know your real numbers. And when you have small numbers, you can't draw conclusions on an individual team basis. So your ability to manage from the numbers is limited. The good news is... Um, I agree with Felipe that the, when you have the information, you learn discrete things for each population. When you don't have the information, there are still first, second, and third order things you can do 
that nas naturally disproportionately benefit people who are least like their manager, right? They're with the managers themselves. Um, and so uh, a lot of times you're sometimes having to implement solutions to see if it cures the ill, as opposed to being able to diagnose the specific problem and solving with a known solution, right? In other words, because you just don't have the data all the time, but you shouldn't be afraid of doing that um, because that as long as you're experimenting quickly and learning quickly, uh, it's better than being stuck by the limitations of the resources you have, because I don't think we're going to solve the lack of data for certain subpopulations anytime soon, because what wasn't in your question, but is also true, is that data is how people are being attacked right now. Undergraduate institutions in the United States, recruitment policies and companies, even though the Supreme Court hasn't ruled on anything yet, people are still looking at it. And now people are going after development programs uh, with the threat that those are supposedly going to be illegal. And also there's been no findings in that place either. But it is causing a lot of clients, and Felipe, you might be hearing the same thing. It is causing a lot of clients to do a lot of internal audits on their language, how they're thinking about things, how they're talking about things, because there is a there is some of this has metastasized and people are fearful. And the fear is not that there's actually going to be legal action. The fear is this: I get wound up in one of these things where someone's claiming it, and then I have to have my lawyers retained, and I get into a public debate. So the, the actions are have a cooling factor, whether there's a legal change or not. They, have, they start to have some impact at scale. So this conflict is real, meaning our desire to have more data so we can address the things that Blue Bay is talking about, which are unique challenges with individual groups and people trying to make your pursuit of that data a liability for you. And that tension is going on right now. And I'm sad to tell you, it's not going anywhere. It's gonna go on for a while. People have been effective enough at it that we're gonna be seeing it for a while. The good news is like when we talk to our, our the companies, um, most companies, they fall into a couple of buckets. There are companies that were never doing much here and this is a reason not to start. There are companies that are going backwards because they're nervous, but they probably were looking for a reason to go a little bit backwards because they've been nervous all along. They just felt like they had to do something. But then there are a lot of companies that are like, so what? Like boards, literally, we talk to them. They're like, we're not, we have to get more clever. But we ain't, we're not changing our, our direction or our path in life. So, Data is important. Also know that it's going to be a point of tension. You have to prepare management teams to with, withstand that tension, which makes it even more important that the data align with the values of the organization that your management team has already assigned, signed on to lead because they believe in those values and they'll fight for them as opposed to something that you sell to them as something they should be doing. So lining the, your data or your initiatives with your values and re-underwriting with managers and preparing them for the pushback that's going to come and reminding them at no other part of the enterprise does 100% of people agree with them. They don't sell 100% of their products. They don't market successfully 100% of the time. They don't get 100% of the contracts they, they want to win. People are going to disagree and you want you have to prepare them for that. And I think sometimes we try to make them feel great about these things and ignore the fact that people are going to disagree with them and that this is going to be tense. I would argue this is a time to be very, very blunt about that and maybe make the argument that if one side or another isn't a little bit mad at us, we're not working hard enough. Like we're not taking enough chances if somebody isn't a little bit upset by what we're doing. So the data is going to be key, but I, but I really think people are going to have to build out a way to think about this and to keep things going in the middle of these fights that might not be data driven because the data might be the debate for a while. And what clients are doing is they're embedding these things in other initiatives without calling it DEI. So they're embedding psychological safety in their safety initiative. They're embedding inclusive leader management behaviors in their general management curriculum and call, saying, calling it making better decisions rather than unconscious bias. Right? People are embedding them and continuing momentum without picking a fight just to not just because they have to. And, um, and we have to be a little less precious about some things at a time like this in order to do that. Yeah, that, uh, that definitely resonates the way that, you know, it's almost a lot of the time, it's almost like about messaging and communication and how do we frame something versus like the core of that thing. Um, we, we had a, we had a question come in from the audience. Someone asked, and you were talking about values. So I think this, this aligns closely with your point, but someone, um, Melinda asked from the audience, can you express how cultural values from diverse employees influence or impact broader company values? I go for, I'll go first, I guess, because I was talking. Yeah, that, that was for you, Jonathan. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I, know, sorry. I didn't realize I was waiting for someone else. Sorry. Um, well, I mean, I, I, listen, um, 
I think she, I think what the question is about specific cultures that we would easily identify as cultures. But remember, every company is a culture, right? They have a history, they have a language, they have things that are subtly rewarded and penalized, right? Um, they might have that geographical footprint that's re relevant. Um, so I think culture comes in a lot. And um, your employees impact your culture every time they show up. I think a lot of times what we talk about with our clients is that you have a culture. The question is, do you know what it is and can you control it? Because it exists. And if you don't have answers to those second and third questions, you have a culture that's probably not helping you. <laughs> it's like it's being determined by all the people in your organization. Um, so cult the cultures that people add ideally add to the culture if you can find a way to include them. Um, if you don't, the culture becomes a, a culture of a few, not many. And that is going to be have a short uh, 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 span horizon or life lifespan. Um, for the following reason, which is every 45-year-old manager working for any company we're talking about over the next 20 years is going to be managing a workforce that's going to be more and more different from her. Generationally, culturally, socioeconomically, neurologically. And the question is, you're paying all of them equally. And that, and she's going to get a lot out of people like her, which is going to be a smaller and smaller number of them, which means you get a less return on the rest. And the people she's getting the less return on are the ones who are more numerous in the, in the in the culture at that point are probably defining the culture outside your organization. In other words, the gap is not linear, it's exponential. It's getting bigger and bigger at a faster rate. So uh, so individual culture, corporate culture, co your, your kind of um, national culture, these are, these are all relevant. If you build cultural competency, I think we describe it in really, like when I, go, when I was in college, we described it in very fantastical terms, but there are a lot of basic things that you are really good at if you have a cultural competency. You're, you're humble, you're self-aware, and you're you're good at um, cognitive empathy, meaning you're really good at put, putting yourself in the other person's shoes and ask them a lot of questions about how they do their best work and how they show up and what they care about so that you can adjust for what their cultural norms are versus your own. Okay. So I think the solutions are, are more simple at the beginning. Very hard to get people to, to do it, but I'm sure other people have different answers. Yeah. And I can see um, people, the people in the audience are saying they really appreciate your pragmatic approach to this. So, you know, touche. Uh, Jamie, maybe turning it over to you. Um, one of the things that, you know, oftentimes is a challenge for organizations is they'll collect the data, they'll see what the results are, but then there's a step from that data collection point to and the analysis to actually acting on the insights that you gather and, you know, implementing programs and policies. Um, the city of Los Angeles has a ton of programs and policies going on. It's very complicated and intricate. How do you go about moving from that insights phase to the actual action phase of uh, DEI implementation? Um, that's a great question because that's the space that we're in right now. <laughs> uh, so we've had a like a a prompt to gather data from all our departments by one vendor. It's taken over a year, and now we're in the place, this in between place of trying to figure out what the next step is going to be, and guiding each of our partners and figuring out what goals they're going to set and how they're going to realize them. Um, you know, and consultation with my team is not something that's necessarily um, required. And so we're really trying to present ourselves in communications and reaching out again, like building, like tapping into those relationships that had been established and developed and worked on over the last few years, you know, really reaching out to people um, and utilizing that, you know, relational equity to say, you know, hey, we're here to support you. We want to partner with you in terms of how you navigate these next steps. Um, there was a lot of investment made in gathering the data, um, you know, and I'm not speaking of like financially even, but, you know, the time it took, the collaboration it took to solicit buy-in, to solicit, you know, collaboration from the departments because they had to make their employees accessible for our vendor to even get the data. Um, and so, you know, we're kind of saying, hey, you're, the hard part's done, you know, to an extent, you know, we don't like tell them that, you know, this could be super challenging too, but, you know, we want to make it approachable for them. And so, you know, we've said, you've already done the investment. Um, so now let's through, you know, like there are so many possibilities and ways in which you can use the data. Um, and we kind of try to we try to not limit uh, the impact of the data that's used strictly to DE trying to explore and meet with 
to figure out, you know, what are the different ways that you can use this data um, in a way that serves what um, you are having the answer for as well with constituents. So is it um, hiring? Is it um, ensuring an equitable impact in the services that you provide to the public? Well, what are your employees saying maybe that you haven't heard that's come out of this data that you can then um, pivot and use to achieve these other objectives that you have that the public is demanding. So, so that's where we're at and that's um, what we're trying to pursue right now. That's really interesting. And I don't know if this is like a contentious question. So feel free to, 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 to redirect me. But, you know, you brought up the fact that the public, it's something that's really, I think, unique to municipalities or governments a lot of the time is that you do have to balance what the public is asking or what your constituents are saying with, you know, the needs of your employees or the way that you're able to run the organization internally and your priorities internally. How do you go about thinking about that, especially, you know, when DEI is such a hot topic right now? You know, it's a really interesting um, dynamic that we are operating in. Um, and I think there's often an assumption that um, the employees that work in a municipality are extensions of the culture that um, put the elected into office. And that's the case, right? Um, and, and I see all my colleagues, she, you know, nodding along because um, I think people have assumptions that, you know, well, um, there was a liberal voice that spoke out and elected certain officials into office. And so therefore everybody else who's a part of the municipality and government organization is a reflection of that. And it's, no, these are civil servants, you know, and um, our city is very diverse. Our employees reflect that diversity in all different sorts of ways. Um, and their culture, you know, their subcultures in all these different departments are a reflection of their own employee experience. You know, I think, What's great is that our employees tend to have longevity in the workplace um, because of, you know, the, the work life balance, the benefits, the pension, all of that. Um, but it's the culture um, of the community and the culture of the workplace in a local government is not always the same thing. And so we have to kind of um, we have to listen to both groups and figure out how to advance the workplace in a way that um, serves both. And that's, yep. there's no, that's really hard. I'm going to be very honest. That's very, very hard. It sounds, it sounds incredibly complicated. Uh, so, you know, you're, you're fighting the good fight. Uh, Joanne, I, I want to turn it to you for, for a second now. And when it comes to complex organizations, this is something you're incredibly familiar with. I think in the construction industry specifically, and you alluded this a little bit, you know, a little bit earlier, there's such a breadth and variety of employees that you have in the organization. You know, if you're, if you're working for like a law firm, for example, it's pretty much safe to assume that, you know, you have paralegals and you have lawyers, but everyone sort of, it's quite similar. Not the case with you. I mean, you have, you know, you have staff who are, have office jobs, you have staff who are on site, you have such a variety of employees who are working with Minto. How do you think about building a culture and building programming that serves them equally? How do you think about sort of advancing all of them when their needs might be so different and nuanced? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. I mean, I, I think I mentioned earlier that we have a very, uh, I'll call it a comprehensive listening strategy um, because we are so diverse. Like we have people out on our construction sites who are literally building homes and putting up framing and doing roofing. And then we have our investment management team who are dealing with Bay Street and Wall Street trying to get you know capital so we can grow the business. And then we have real estate lawyers and everything in between, uh, room attendants who clean our first suites when our guests move out. So it is very, very diverse. And um, how we recruit, how we compensate, there's lots of challenges there, but it really comes down to collecting, you know, meaningful insight from all of our employees. So as part of our listening strategy, I mean, we do a lot of different things. We have our engagement survey, which a lot of organizations do, and we use the Gallup Q12, but we supplement that with a lot of very specific verbatim questions. Um, we partner with yourselves to do our DEI survey, but we do a lot of different pull surveys along the way, depending on what we're dealing with. Through COVID was a perfect example. Like we would check in with our employees around what are their needs, their issues, their concerns. And we were actually able to take a lot of that feedback both from our site and our office employees to come up with strategies to help them as we were going through COVID. 
you know, we recently just did a benefits and wellness survey because we know we need to make some changes uh, to our benefits offering so that we can address the unique needs of certain segments of our population, whether it's women's health or neurodiverse or mental health or what have you. So we're constantly asking for feedback, but we also do new hires coming in, we do surveys with them to understand what the recruiting experience was like for them, what were some of the things that worked really well, what are some things that we need to do differently. Um, you know, when we do have employees who choose to leave uh, the organization, we meet with them, we want to understand why and, you know, take that feedback again to, you know, address the issues that come up. And we also do what I call stay interviews. Now, I will say that that's a little more accepted at the, uh, I'll say the office uh, uh, type of staff where managers sit down with the staff to talk to them about you know, what is keeping you here at Minter? When you wake up in the morning, what makes you excited to get out of bed and go to work? And what makes you want to hit the snooze button and stay in bed? Um, what's important to you? How do you like to be recognized? Like, how do you want to grow to your career? Like all of those questions that comes down to the individual employees. We put a lot of emphasis on that. We do have those conversations with our site staff. Um, but it is a different type of dynamic where they come into work and then they're just gone. They're not sitting in a, an area where it's easy to have a meeting. So, um, but we continue to have that dialogue. So I think generally speaking through all the, and the CEO chats, I talked about that in the leadership forums that we have with managers and leaders sitting with their organizations to, you know, ask for feedback on how things are going. So overall, we have a really good handle, I think, on what's top of mind for our employees. But the challenge is, of course, coming up with solutions to all the various challenges because the, the needs and issues are unique. Um, so again, it's just part of our, our, I'll call it people strategy. Um, the other thing I think is around our comp structure. Like we are, you know, very focused on having uh, a progressive compensation uh, practice, um, in real estate construction, a lot of organizations, um, when it comes to things like their bonus plans, they only bring those down to management level, maybe director level. Um, that's changing, but, you know, we have always been on the page that all of our employees were all part of one team. So regardless of what job you do, um, what level you're at, it doesn't matter. You're part of our annual bonus program. We all have the common goals. We all share in the results of the business. So we try to, um, you know, be progressive and stay ahead of the curve in terms of what's going on in the market. Uh, do market adjustments when we see that things are, you know, um, the wages are, you know, a challenge. And in today's world, that's you know, a particular challenge with, with inflation and so on, but we are constantly looking at that. Um, and some of the other things I mentioned, the, looking at our benefits plan, but we're also, you know, doing a very detailed pay equity analysis and uh, putting some strategies in place to address where we know we think, or where, where we believe we have some challenges um, from a pay perspective. So overall, it's um, a bunch of things that we do to try and address all the very unique needs. And um, the nice thing about it, though, is being such a diverse, having such diverse opportunities in an organization like that uh, provides for lots of great career development, internal mobility opportunities. So we put a lot of emphasis on career development. So we run workshops with our staff to, um, you know, how to do a development plan, how to set a career plan. We run workshops for our managers on how to have those career conversations. And one of the things that we just recently launched, it was a direct feedback from the survey, our recent survey that we did with uh, Diversio with you guys was a mentorship program. So we, um, career development was identified as something we can still do better at. Um, and the question I think is really more around, is there somebody in a position of influence who's invested in your development? So even though we're doing all these other things like career development, that connection with somebody in a position of influence. So we've just launched our mentorship program. We've had, um, I think, I have to check with my learning director, but we've had something like 60 manage or leaders uh, sign up in the first week. So we're pretty excited about that. And I think that's going to, you know, continue to push us along. Uh, that journey of, you know, having uh, it, the best place for our staff to work regardless of what you do and you can grow your career. There, so. Yeah, that that really resonates uh, with myself and also with uh, the attendees. You, you, We have some comments coming in saying that it's really fantastic that you're not talking about a one size fits all model. You're really looking at the differences and, you know, the different needs of all the employees. Um, and I will say, you know, if I may, uh, as a as a as a vendor of yours, the the efforts are paying off. You're you're making some incredible incredible strides with inclusion, and I think that that's ultimately what we're all you know working towards. Um, so 
uh, to to close us off, Felipe, not to put you on the spot, uh, but uh, you will be our kind of final bringing us home, uh, bringing us home speech. Um, I think one of the things that, you know, we see, saw come through through the Q&A and just generally for, for the session, uh, as someone who works with so many different organizations and, you know, the breadth of expertise you shared with us earlier, what are what is a piece of advice or, you know, what is your top, like, pieces of advice that you would uh, leave our listeners off with today in terms of what they should be focusing on and how they should be thinking about their DI strategies and implementation. Great. Yes, I, I'll go back to something that Tina shared. Um, it is about working on the, on, the, on the root causes. And, and here's where data becomes essential. Data will guide you around where you have issues and it can tell you the size of your gaps, which in turn will help you decide where you're going to spend your time and your resources, uh, will help you prioritize. So the, 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 the important thing here in terms of, of making those decisions is that um, this takes a lot of effort and it takes time. Like something that the Jonathan talked about is that you should sometimes you don't have the data. So you have to set up the right structure and the framework to start capturing that data so that a year from today, you can start looking back and say, I want to look at my application uh, funnel and I want to look at the pass through rates. So you have to invest time in doing that. But at the same time, something that Joanne, I think, uh, said was when you think about um, understanding the why, which is very hard to find the data will not answer the why something is happening or how you're going to fix it it takes time to have the conversations and it takes an effort to set up a framework that you can analyze we have many clients some clients fortune 50 that we ask them about exit interviews and they have this information in word documents and it's very hard for them to extract insights out of these pieces of information. So we help clients set up a framework on how they do exit interviews, how they uh, can also semi-structure information around stay interviews. That was what uh, Joanne was talking about. And sometimes even entry interviews. We work with some clients looking at entry 90 day interviews. And, and we have been very successful because employees are more likely to give us the truth as a nonprofit that comes to third party than when they talk to HR. So the takeaway is do the hard work to set up the frameworks that you need, do the hard work to get into the root causes so that you can make the right strategic decisions and you get away from what we call random acts of diversity. Uh, I'll end with that. Random acts of diversity versus strategy and something cohesive and something that's organization wide. I love that. Um, so thank you. So that was like the perfect thing to end on. Thank you so much, Felipe. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for your panelists, Jamie, Joanne, Jonathan, Felipe. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I don't want to say that this was the best panel of the day, but I'm going to. Uh, we're we finished off on a high note. So thank you all so much. And uh, we'll uh, we'll you know if anyone wants to be connected with anyone, we can we can do that. Um, so and then I just want to say some closing remarks to everyone who has joined for the session. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. This has been an absolute pleasure to have this conversation. As you know, we do an annual inclusion summit. And I will say that this is probably um, the conversations here today and sort of the, I think the realness of the way that our panelists um, came and shared was truly inspirational. Uh, so thank you again to all of the panelists, uh, as well as the team at Diversio who helped put, put all of this together. Um, Please don't forget that we are offering a free complimentary accreditation. So it's a diversity, equity, and inclusion certification for any professional, individual, anyone really who wants to sort of set a foundational knowledge of DEI. It includes um, you, uh, courses on recruiting, inclusive recruiting and hiring, workplace flexibility, unconscious bias in the workplace, allyship, leveraging and using data, which is pertinent to this panel. So please, please take advantage of that. And then, of course, if you are from a company or an organization that could uh, use some help uh, when it comes to data collection or processing, we're also offering a discount to our platform. So uh, please, uh, please make use of that. 
Um, and with that, I will wrap up the Inclusion Summit of 2023. Huge thanks to our sponsors. Um, of course, we have our a &M, MLT, and the Investor Leadership Network. It's been a pleasure working with you. And I hope everyone goes and enjoys this beautiful day. It feels like uh, in, in Canada, at least in Toronto, it feels like a late summer. So everyone should get outside. And hopefully wherever we're in, well, like in LA, it always feels like a late summer. So, but anyway, enjoy every, uh, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, see you soon. Bye everyone. Bye.